Word. Hey, everybody. Uh, Dan Crawl here. Thanks again for tuning in to the Athletics Podcast, Wes Hancock, Britton Kanawa. This is episode 14. Uh, today I have Chad Trollson. Uh, Chad, I'd just like to welcome you and go ahead and say hi to everybody if you'd like. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You bet. Um, our video is a, about a half second delay, so just bear with us a little bit on that. Um, before we get to Chad, though, uh, I just want to remind people, of, uh, episode 13, I talked to the 1980 Girls State Championship basketball team, had a great chat with them. Um, the first 13 episodes, we have almost 5,000 views, so I, I really appreciate everybody coming on here and watching and listening to these. Um, once again, I have Chad on today. Before we get to him, though, um, I have four sponsors, uh, five actually, four long-term and one one episode sponsor I want to get to here. Uh, like always, the goal is to raise money for the Legacy Fund and let people tell their stories and reminisce. There's five sponsors, so we're going to take a few extra minutes tonight to recognize those sponsors that gave to the Legacy Fund, and that's what this podcast is all about. Uh, those four long-term sponsors, Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company, Jay Hiscox of State Farm Insurance, Deemer Realty, and the Brit Vet Clinic. Uh, so throughout the episode, I'll highlight their businesses. Thanks again to those for doing some long-term sponsorships. And then tonight, I also have a one-episode sponsor. That's the Party Taxi out of Brit. The Party Taxi is here to help you with all your party bus needs, weddings, bachelor, bachelorette parties, birthday parties, proms, teen parties, or just a night out on the town. They've got you covered. Contact the Party Taxi on Facebook or call them at 641-860-0498. They're owned by Scott and Kylie Dolphin. And again, that's the party taxi out of Brit. Uh, the guy on my, the screen with me tonight is also sponsoring a different episode in the next coming months. Um, if you out there would like to sponsor an episode or two or five or 10, uh, please message me anytime. I'm especially looking for businesses outside of Britain Kanawa that could sponsor whose business could be utilized by people inside Britain Kanawa in the area. Um, I just secured one of those type of businesses that are down here in southern Iowa for three episodes this winter, so I'm pretty excited for that, hoping to get some more of those. Uh, let's talk Wes Hancock sports here. Uh, cross country team starts practicing here in the next week or so. They're led by Holly Lang, a good friend of mine, their head coach. Volleyball's head coach is Michelle DeHart. She was one of my teachers, and she was the coach back then, and she's uh, back running the program again, so hope they have a good season. And football, uh, head coach Mark Sanger, I think they started camp yesterday or today, and then practice starts next week. Their first game's on the 27th at Garner, and then they go to Newman on September 3rd. A uh, relative of mine is the head coach at Newman, so uh, it pains me, but I have to cheer for Newman unless they're playing Wes Hancock to, to support him. They're good, good people. So uh, The school is fundraising for a new greenhouse, so if you want to contact the school to give to that project, that'd be a great thing to do as well. And then Bill Frito is making his last pitch. I saw an ad on or a thing on Facebook today, trying to get people signed up for the alumni banquet. That's on Friday, August 13th at five o'clock at the school. Uh, they've actually asked me to speak, so I'm guessing they're just desperate for entertainment. Uh, he wants me to speak about the uh, the record book and the podcast and all that good stuff. So reach out to Bill on Facebook for info on how to sign up for the alumni banquet. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to give to the Sanger Legacy Fund, go to sangerstrong.com. That's sangerstrong.com. You can give recurring payments. You can give a one-time payment. If you want to sponsor, that's the way that you, you sponsor this is by going there and giving. Thanks, as always, to Al DeWard for making that site easy, easy way to give to the Legacy Fund. Uh, cornhole boards, the Coach Sanger cornhole boards. August 25th is the, the drawing for that. There's still time to buy raffle tickets. For that, I'll be in Brit during Hobo Days to sell tickets Friday night uptown um, and then at Hobo Golf on Saturday as well. Before we get to chat here, my new segment I started last episode is called the five episodes ago and 10 episodes ago segment. I'm doing this to help people rehash uh, prior episodes to get more views, to help those people who advertise get some more advertising and to keep the legacy fun in people's minds. So five episodes ago was episode nine. I talked with the 1986 Girls State Championship golf team. We talked about their season and uh, Mr. G, their coach and our teacher. Ten episodes ago on episode four, I chatted with the first ever Iowa four-time state wrestling champion, Bob Steenledge. Bob is a professional speaker as well, and he's always looking for speaking engagements. So Google his website, check him out. Um, he's a great speaker, great guy. 
Um, I'll have links posted for those two episodes uh, on this episode tonight, so check those out. All right, here we go. Enough of me talking. I always have to get through all that stuff here. Um, like I said, I'm here with Chad Trollson. He's I coined him the British man who ever did Brit. He loves his hometown uh, just as much as anybody, and I've had a real uh, privilege of getting to know him the last year or so talking a lot of Wes Hancock football. So, Chad, go ahead, introduce yourself to everyone who's listening or watching, uh, where you're at, your family, your job, anything you want to share out right away here. Go ahead. Well, uh, well, well I, I appreciate the 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 title uh you uh gave to me and uh i i am a big fan of brit obviously and i suppose that um you know when you when you move out of state and you don't get to go home um and it's my home so you don't get to go as home as often as you like um you got to compensate somehow. So there's probably not anybody in Texas that's ever met me, including the thousands of students I teach at the university who have not heard about Brit. And uh, so, you know, I walk around a little bit prouder, uh, especially when I have a Brit shirt on or a Brit jersey, or I I can get a shirt for my daughter uh, that she can wear. And people ask, where's Brit? So everybody knows where Brit is. I love the hometown. I miss it a lot. Um, I always enjoy coming back. And uh, like I said, I moved out of the state after I graduated from the University of Northern Iowa, and I uh, came down to Texas to go to graduate school and um, met my wife, and we have a 14-year-old daughter who is now getting into the, the throes of high school as a freshman and, uh, and one that's uh, competing for uh, a varsity spot, and so it's, it'll be interesting to, to see if any of those uh, valuable lessons I learned from my coaches and teachers and Brit, you know, kind of rubbed off on me in terms of uh, parenting my daughter as she gets into the athletics. So, um, but that's what I've been up to, just teaching students at, at the university and uh, following Brit, uh, Brit schools, uh, athletics and non-athletic stuff, so. Uh, what do you, what do you teach at the school there? Do you want to tell people where you're at and what you're doing there? Yeah, I, I uh, teach at the University of North Texas. I'm a criminal justice professor and uh, uh, this is, uh, I believe, uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, this is the start of my 20th year. Oh, wow. uh, so I, I guess the, I guess I'm one of the veterans uh, now. So I, I suppose I have to, um, you know, act like it, I guess, uh, <laughs> you know, so, which I do, which I do. I enjoy the job. I, uh, I particularly enjoy mentoring other uh, students for sure. But uh but also other faculty members who are just starting their careers out. So that's, I, I take a lot of enjoyment in that. So you uh, graduated in 92. So uh, I've asked this to some of the other guys that you kind of grew up with, but what was, what was it like growing up in Britain, the mid to late eighties, early nineties? What, what were the things to do, places to go? What would you get? What would that look like for you guys? It was, uh, I mean, in my opinion, the best time, the best, best era to grow up and I'm sure other people would say the same thing but you know there's a reason Dan today that they're you know remaking movies and tv series focused on the 80s and early 90s because it was it was awesome and mm -hmm. um I, I didn't grow up in any other town than Brit so I can't tell you what it was like there but in if I bet Brit was a, a typical 80s mecca um, compared to elsewhere. And, uh, you know, what do we do? You know, we rode mopeds, um, that, you know, those, those kind of, uh, came into real fashion, um, about the time I was old enough to ride them, um, maybe a few years before that. And, um, you know, you can't talk about the eighties and Brit without talking about Piccadilly pizza and Mark's pizza. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you, you probably heard about that, haven't you? Oh, a little uh, bit. And, yeah, you know all about that. And uh, in reality, though, that was, I think, a, a, if I'm being completely honest, that was a, a really big part of town. Best best pizza uh, uh, I've had. And, um, uh, you know, the bowling alley and renting VCRs and, and things that, that kids probably take for granted today. And um, mm -hmm. meeting at the football field um and, and playing uh pickup games with with our friends and uh and then when you got your driver's license cruising maine uh you know they they might as well just uh 
make a move about Brit because that's uh, that's what it was all about. It was it was a good time and is a, a close knit community, close friends. Yep, definitely. Yep, we did a lot of the same things. I was in the era where I just started. We started getting cell phones as seniors or so, and so I feel like we were kind of that last era of just going out and doing stuff with people, riding your bikes, going cruising, stuff like that. And then shortly after, it was pretty technology driven, which is you know technology is good. We can do this from Texas yeah. and Iowa, but growing up, you know, we were just out and about all the time. So. And, uh, and you, you just made me feel old by saying you got a cell phone when you were a senior. Um, so, so thanks for that. I appreciate that. But, but yeah, it was a, it was a, we didn't, we didn't have the tech and uh, that that's um, I, I actually, I kind of miss that sometimes, but also the, the tech is great because we can do these things right here. And uh, uh, I think that's outstanding too. Yeah. It's a double-edged sword. Definitely. So. You're actually the fourth 1992 graduate I've had on this uh, podcast. I've had Rick Sanger, I've had Nate Schur, John DeLeon. Who are some other classmates, friends, teachers, coaches that you uh, maybe are still in contact with or you have good memories of, life lessons they taught you, stories, anything like that you want to share? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, you could probably go on for three hours talking about that. And I know we don't have that time, but. Um... We could, but you know. yeah, we could, we could, um, you know, uh, you know, I, ha I have a twin brother, so I grew up with, you know, a, a best friend uh, in that sense. So we were all together friends with, with all kinds of people. Um, but, but I would say, you know, for, for me, uh, oh, there you go. There you go. That's a great picture. That's, that's, yeah. there's the Trollson brothers right there. I love but, it. Dug that um, up this morning. I had to point out your glasses that you guys wore. We're, we're yeah, that, yeah, those were serious glasses. Um, and you, you know, nothing got by me with those glasses. I'll tell you that much, um, <laughs> but, but I didn't wear them playing football or wrestling. So that maybe a person, I might've missed one tackle, you know, maybe yeah. one, I'm not sure. Um, those things but, wouldn't fit uh, in your helmet. What, no, they would, <laughs> they would not. Um, no contacts for me back then. So, yeah. uh, no, but we used to, um, you know, uh, Ben Swears is a real good friend of mine, uh, grown up um, uh, from young age, daily owns. Uh, I'd say J John Madsen was one of my best friends, still is. Um, and, and he and I would, uh, in addition to sports and uh, when we were, we were younger, uh, his dad would take us to wrestling tournaments. Um, so, so I spent a lot of time with John Matson, um, not only in sports and school and all of that, but, uh, we liked the pheasant hunt. And so you could bet in the fall, um, you know, after a football game, uh, once it got, it got to October, uh, early November, we, we'd be pheasant hunting on Saturdays, mm -hmm. um, throughout the winter, um, the Cooley brothers, uh, spent a lot of time with them, you know, Rick Sanger, uh, Travis Hagen, uh, who's a year above us. Um, uh, Spencer gear was a good friend that, that, you know, all, all these, uh, these are all, uh, fellows that, you know, we played football with wrestled with and ran track, or if you're in baseball, uh, I was in baseball for, uh, I think my freshman year and then I, I didn't I do that anymore. Um, I couldn't, I kind of don't think I could see the ball, Dan, and I don't know why with those glasses, but, um, I, uh, I was just too slow, I think, to hit the ball. Uh, so I, I wasn't helping the team out. I don't think that much. Um, uh, but, but yeah, that's, you know, you know, as far as friends, I mean, and, I, and I'm, I'm, and I know I'm missing some, you know, Kerry Huspeth, Derek Sink, uh, played on the team, you know, we we're just, we, we all grew up together and, you know, it's a town like Brit, you go look at your kindergarten class. Yeah, you're probably going to have 95% of those kids go all the way through with you uh, from the age of five on. Um, and then that's not to mention, uh, you know, my my close and first cousins, Brian and Brett and Edmund, uh, two uh, phenomenal football players and and in other sports as well, but uh, definitely football. So uh, Boothroyds, you know, so there's a whole lot of people we can talk about, but um, um yeah, we had a great time with those friends, and I enjoy seeing them when I come home. And then the teachers, Dan, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I liked them all. Um, I liked them all. Um, I, I think uh, I gave some particular fits early on. Maybe Mr. Timmerman probably 
I had to straighten me out a few times and Mr. Granjanet for sure. And then, you know, the coaches, uh, of course, uh, in the process of uh, trying to make a person like me a, a young man, you know, um, uh, you know, they, they had to intervene in certain areas, not, nothing big, just, you know, uh, growing up stuff, but uh, loved all, all the teachers, um, uh, even the principal and superintendent. Uh, uh, I enjoy them as well. Um, but yeah, Mr. Timmerman was was uh, was one I had a lot of interaction with. Uh, Mr. Pauls, uh, Coach Perkins, Coach Sanger, um, Mr. Brum, um, you, you know, there, the whole lot of people. Uh, Al Olson, one of the school's custodians, was a um, was was a real uh, a real big influence on me, and still is. Uh, very very close friends, and um, every time I have a chance to get home, um, I go hunting with Al. Uh, you know, he taught me how to water ski and taught me how to hunt and, 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 and do these things. So I just have tremendous memories of friends and, and coaches and teachers. And sometimes coaches and teachers are the same thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, and just every, it, the whole staff, um, at the school, Peggy Iceman and, you know, just everybody. So it's, it's good thinking about them and remembering them. And, uh, and I, I really like running into them when I, when I go home and, because I've aged a little bit, I make sure to tell everybody my name. <laughs> uh, I don't want them to, who's this guy here? How do I know this person? So, yeah, it's, uh, you mentioned a few names. It's kind of cool because you and I have only met in person like once, I think now. But yep. you, me, Eric Cooley, Brian Nedved, Rick Sanger, and then also Kevin McDermott and um, Mark Sanger's wife. And who else is in the, We have a Facebook thread that we we yeah. messed with Travis Hagan um, yep. a, a thread we all talk about Sandcock football on quite a bit especially when we we're I was putting the record book together so got to meet a lot of a lot of you guys and and communicate with you guys a lot over the, the last year or two it's been a lot of fun so yeah it's, it's, it's been great um and you're right like you said we we met once at the public golf tournament last year mm -hmm. and I picked up the record book um and uh but I feel like I've known you for years. Uh, and then the, the Mark's Pizza connection just kind of, you know, sealed the deal there, you know? Oh, yeah. You know, I still, I'm still I mean, trying I, to get, I'm still trying to get, get that recipe from you. I'm going to keep bugging you. I'm, I'm, and the technique, you know, going to know how to make it. So, yep. yep. It's been, they sold that place almost 20 years ago. And I still cannot go to Hobo Days and not have 10 to 20 people mention to me how they, love that place and they miss that place and it's never been the same and it's still good i've been to the other places since my parents had it but people just it's that nostalgia feel i think is part of it as well so it, it very much is it, 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 it was great too um the, the whole it's an institution in my mind so the whole institution is great so don't leave that recipe just laying around somewhere <laughs> guard that yeah i don't know if my dad even knew it he just knew how to make them so he, yeah. he uh he and I, he'd have a pizza in the oven and he knew he had exactly 11 minutes before he needed to take it out. Him and I would go out back and play catch, play baseball together. And he would, in his head, know exactly how much time he had. And he would never, I don't know if he ever burnt a pizza. He had that thing down to a science. So <laughs> he, he was an artist. I'll tell you that. Yep. I had a good childhood. That's for sure. Uh, so we're going to get to, to Chad's athletic career at West Hancock here. But before we do that, I have a couple sponsors to get to. Uh, we'll start with Michael and Brianne Ewing of Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company. They have locations in Britt, Kanawha, Clarion, Belmont, and Dows. Mike's a 98 graduate of West Hancock, and his family's been privileged to serve the communities of Britt and Kanawha since 1977. You can find them online at ewingfh.com, go to Facebook, or you can call them at 843-3839 or 762-3211. That's Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company. I want to thank them for sponsoring 20 episodes. I've also, uh, like I said, a couple episodes ago, gained a new long-term sponsor with Jay Hiscox of State Farm Insurance. The Jay Hiscox State Farm Team in Brit is a proud supporter of Wes Hancock and the Sanger Legacy Fund. They can help you with all your insurance needs, including auto, home, life, farm, business, and renter's insurance. For a free quote or review, give Jay or Lindsay a call at 641-843. 3563. Uh, they said, Go Eagles. Thanks to Jay and his team for hopping on board and sponsoring 15 of these episodes. All right, here we go. Let's dig in, talk about some sports. We're going to start with track, then we'll move on to football. 
And then we're going to end with wrestling because I especially want to talk about your crazy state tournament in 92, helping the team earn a runner up trophy. And you had to, to take the hard way to the, to the podium that season. So let's start with track. Um, you wanted to tell the story about uh, you called coach Sanger, told him that you just wanted to throw a shot, right? Yes, and sir. he got a little nervous, maybe thought you were quitting on him. Uh, so tell that story you want, you wanted to share with everybody about coach. Yeah, that was a, uh, it, it was interesting to me and now I don't know if he was all that nervous I wasn't that valuable I don't think for a track but you know I started out uh as a freshman um running uh the four by eight the half mile basically uh race and then uh we did the the last track event which was the four by four so I ran the half and quarter miles and you know, I don't think I was ever particularly talented in track or fast. I I think the only thing I probably had going for me uh, was that, um, you know, I just kind of refused to quit. And so um, I just, just kept running until I couldn't run anymore. And again, not, not necessarily that all that good at it and remind uh, you that I had those glasses on. So those weighed me down a little bit too. And they probably caught some wind. So they, they should account for some of that. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, absolutely. I don't know, but yeah, I think, you know, something, but, you know, we started out doing that. And so I ran the half miles and the quarters, uh, which, you know, I kind of, well, I would say I liked it, but I didn't, I didn't really hate it. Um, and that's, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I like Coach Sanger's philosophy on on uh, probably everything, but I liked I liked his his way. Uh, him and Coach Haugie, uh in terms of track, you know, Coach Sanger would always say, you know, if you were a multiple event athlete in track, he he would always say things like, uh, you know, what what are you saving yourself for? You know, you got three races. What you get? You should be running them all the way out, all three of them. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. But um, but I did the half miles and then had some, uh, some injury setbacks my junior year. But, uh, by the time we got to my senior year in track, you know, we had just gotten done with the wrestling season and, you know, so I, you know, I wrestled 171 pounds and had to cut quite a bit of weight to get down to that after football. So by the time track started, I might, you know, I was probably up to 190 pounds and I just, uh, you know, um, I, I didn't think I was going to be real effective running half miles anymore. Um, and I've, I've always liked the shot put. I threw that when I was younger, um, uh, in, you know, junior high and, and things like that. And so, so I, if I recall, I talked to Rick Sanger, um, who was also a phenomenal field athlete, also a runner, but also a field athlete. He did the shot in a discus. Mm-hmm. And um, I told, you know, I, I told him, I go, I, I think I just want to throw the shot put. And so I, I just, I go, I'm going to call your dad. And I don't know why I didn't just talk to him in person. I think it might've been on the weekend. I didn't want to wait until Monday. And so I, I believe it was a Saturday. I just called him up and maybe Rick would had talked to him before. And maybe I didn't, you know, clarify. And so we were, you know, we were talking and, and uh, I told him, I just, I, I want to throw the shot put, I, you know, I want to focus on that. I, 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 you know, I think I can do well uh, in it. And, you know, we talked for a little bit and, and, and he agreed. And so that was the plan, but he, he, he thought I was going to quit the track team and uh, which that, you know, quitting uh, on coach Sanger was just simply was not going to happen. I don't care what, what it was, but, mm-hmm. uh, it, track wasn't going to be it. And so, um, it kind of started an interesting season for me, uh, because, uh, a traditional, most shot putters, you know, they, they wind, wind up their leg and they jump back one step and then twist and throw the thing. But the other way to throw a shot put is to do basically a, 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 a turning motion um and get a lot of momentum going and 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 then launch it and so um you know i wasn't uh too particularly big to do the traditional way to throw a shot put and it limited my range to where i could throw that thing so i started this spinning 
method and there was no internet I could look to to see how you do it and I don't even know if I got a book I just kind of started to do it mm -hmm. and and I'll tell you um, I would go out there every day the whole practice and throw that shot put I would come there on the weekends and most of the time you know on a Saturday afternoon I just go out there and throw the shot put and inevitably rick sanger would show up too for you know unplanned and throw the discus and throw the shot and whatever mm -hmm. uh, but I, re I really wanted to work at that and so we had a few meets i uh narrowly missed hitting a person um with a shot put uh because i was out of control because uh, i was just learning it um and almost hit someone from brit uh at another track meet but by the end of the season, I got that down. And so it took me about four track meets to kind of get control. And then I really honed in on it. So that's just kind of how it started. But coach thought I was going to quit. And that wasn't my intent. I really wanted to focus on that shot put. Yep. How, uh, how, I think you were, weren't you somewhat close to making the state that year in the shot? Or did I read that wrong? Or do you remember how close you were, how successful you were? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was very close. So back then, I, I'm not sure how it works now. Uh, you had so many meets, obviously, and then um, they would track the throws throughout the state or your class. And then mm -hmm. um, by the last track meet, um, you you know you could see where everybody was at and you qualified or not. Mm -hmm. It the unfortunate part about it is that our last track meet was at Clear Lake, and I had not qualified yet, or my I I was in the hunt, but. Um, it, kind of knew that, you know, you really had to get a couple more feet to probably lock in a state um, berth. And uh, so we went to Clear Lake and of course it was a complete downpour. And I don't know if you've ever tried to throw a shot put on slick cement, but it did not, you know, it didn't work. You know, I, I don't know if I placed or what, but uh, I didn't qualify for state. But again, back then the way they did it, uh, you know, the next week we had the conference championship in Brit. And I got second place at conference. I think I, well, I know I beat Rick Sanger, which just put a smile across my face. Okay. Uh, so, so that was excellent. And uh, now I always like teasing Rick. Uh, he's a good friend. Um, but that throw, uh, the throws I had at conference would have easily qualified um, easily for state. And so I kind of missed out. I, and I, and I believe it was, uh, I believe it was, was coach Timmerman uh, was at that conference track meet and and you know he came up and he said you know if we would have got that throw a week ago or whatever weeks ago you know you'd be going to state they just they didn't count the conference uh yeah, championship sure. so yeah I missed out I missed out that that uh that that, that kind of made me sad but you know it is what it is yeah well not too bad considering that was the only year you ever did it I mean it's not like yeah. you did all four years and had all that experience. You just kind of figured it out a little bit and went with it. So yeah, speaking, yeah. Speaking of Rick Sanger, you wanted to throw in a story here. It's not track exactly, but I thought this is a good a spot to put it as any. You wanted to talk about chasing down Rick at the Hobo Day 5K run, putting him on notice or something. Go ahead. And yeah, we, we, yeah, you know, Hobo Day weekend, that's the weekend before, typically, or back then, I, today it may be a little different, but that's the weekend before football practice started, two days and all of that, and uh, and Rick won't admit it, um, but I chased him down in the 5K, and, um, you know, we, I don't know, we, uh, we were almost approaching Lions Park, maybe half a block away from Lions Park, maybe a block, and uh, that's where it ended and started the race, and you know, I had my Walkman on and, uh, uh, you know, playing some music and um, um, I look ahead of me and I see Rick running and I thought, well, there's no no way this is Rick Sanger. I'm that close to him. <laughs> and so I, I sprinted him down and I, I ran by him so fast. Um, and by, mind you, I was about to collapse uh, running a 5K and which is weird because I've been running all summer but uh anyway but once I got past him he decided to speed up and then he just just flew right by me um but yeah we put you know putting Rick on notice because you know he was one of the you you know this Dan it's uh 
we like messing with Rick a little bit. Um, but you know, Rick, Rick's one of the best athletes ever to come out of Brit. Um, and, uh, you know, he's the type of type of guy, uh, that I looked up to, uh, as an athlete, uh, certainly a person, but as an athlete, that's what I think a lot of people strive to be. And if they didn't, they probably should have. And so any opportunity, uh, that I could compete with Rick to see where I stacked up. I did it. Even the hobo 5k or football practice. I always wanted to go against him in an Oklahoma drill, anything like that. Um, um, again, sometimes just to mess with Rick a little bit cause he's a good friend, but also because he was that type of athlete and you, you really, you know, you want to see if you're worth, worth your salt. Um, going against people like that so yeah it was a funny story like I said I don't think he'll admit it that I passed him in the 5k but you know you never know yeah yeah it's your story you stick with it that's all you got to do yeah, oh, yeah yeah people hear this and don't hear his side who knows what's your, your story so, <laughs> we don't know yeah. so let, let's move on to football here uh, you played for coach Sanger for four years from uh, 1988 to 1991 um, this has already been documented in some other episodes, but you guys were 29 and eight in those four years. You won two conference titles. Uh, your freshman year, you guys made it to the semis. Uh, your sophomore year, you missed the playoffs. That was the first year of the consolidation. And then the last two seasons, 90 and 91, you guys made the playoffs, lost in the first round. Um, in the, the record book I have just next to me right here, um, in 1989, your sophomore year, you had three tackles and all three of them were sacks which back then it was hard to find any sack um, statistics because they just weren't recorded much or anything. So you're, you're kind of up there on the list for sacks because there's just not a lot of information. I'm also on yep. that list, which is nice, but that's just due to lack of information. Um, <laughs> then your junior year, uh, 1990, you guys were seven and two, but you won the conference championship. Uh, you ran through most of your schedule, not a lot of close games. Uh, you did lose to Garner beat North Iowa by 11, and then that's the team who beat us in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, what do you remember from your first uh, three years of football, 88 to 1990? What are some memories that come into your head here? Yeah, it was, uh, well, as a freshman, um, it, you know, that the class of 89, the 88 team uh, was, you know, that was my sister's class, and that was Brian Nedved's class my cousin and mm. um so you know of course I was on JV but uh when they went to the the dome uh coach Sanger uh wanted me to dress uh for varsity and so mm. that was that was great I got to go it's the only time I've been to the dome on the actual floor um in that game and uh and they came up short but uh, that that was a real experience and especially going with those guys on that team because I knew a lot of them through my sister and um and it, it was great because they were you know like i said earlier i'm having i'm dealing with the daughter here is going to be a freshman and in athletics and you know sometimes you, you can get worried about that and um i feel good i live in a town that's kind of like brit and you know I, I relay my experience with seniors and things like that the the, the brit fellas really took me under their wing and, and a lot of us um and really mentored us uh, and things like that. So it was a great uh, season. I didn't play at all. Um, I got to go to the dome and, and, and watch an exciting team uh, really, really scrape and dig to win their games. And that was, that was really motivating uh, for, for a young kid like me at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sophomore year uh, was great. I actually got um, a, a little playing time here and there, not much. Um, it was usually near the end of the game, but you know, as a sophomore, they'd throw me in there. And um, uh, you know, those three sacks you talked about, those occurred in one game at Belmont. And I, I, I don't know, I just, I was playing nose guard and I don't know, I, I kind of felt sorry for that Belmont quarterback because <laughs> if I'd have been playing the whole game, I might have had 30 sacks. I don't know what was going on, but um, that was really fun. And I got, I got a few, a few other opportunities to make a few plays and I got ran over a couple of times, but I still made the tackle. So as a senior or as a sophomore, so that was, that was great. Um, really enjoyed that and getting those little opportunities to once you get in the game, just show what you got. Uh, so that, that was fun. Um, 
junior year was, um, the, uh, for me personally, the junior year was a, a year of disappointments uh, because of injuries. Um, I started varsity with a very talented team. Uh, I started at guard and right guard. And I also played uh, defensive end for Tony Wright when he was uh, out. He was also running back. So sometimes mm -hmm. I would be on the defense. So that was the plan. And then I, I, I tore my meniscus in our first game at Rockford after a, a rain and lightning delay. And, you know, you, you have a torn meniscus. You, I tried to practice, and, um, uh, but you really, there's not much you can do with that because your knee locks up. And so I, after I think the second game, uh, we, you know, we went and saw the doctor and um, a meniscus tear, had to have surgery. And interestingly enough, the, the doctor in the room, I mean, I, I, I can still remember that meeting to this day, um, you, you know, just said, yeah, you know, you're never going to, you're never going to play football again. And so, you know, today it makes me laugh because a meniscus tear is nothing. Um, but, you know, back then, uh, really didn't come from a family of athletes. Uh, so didn't have the experience on that. And, um, but when that doctor said that, I just, you know, there was just not even, what do you mean you're not going to play football? You're starting on Brit West Hancock as a junior. You don't think I'm going to play football again? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of like, well, why don't you just fix the knee? We'll take care of the other stuff. And so we got the knee fixed, and I was able to make it back for the last game, that first playoff game where we where we lost. And that was uh, – that that I felt bad for those seniors. Um um, and I, I, you know, just enjoyed playing those two, two games, like a game and a half with them. But I, the way that ended, uh, that season, I, you know, that I, I never, you know, you never hate, like to lose, but, but that was a tough, tough loss again fr from a group that was extremely talented. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the junior year was kind of a bust and then got another knee issue, um, a few weeks later on the other knee in wrestling. And so I missed almost the entire wrestling season. So it was kind of a, a dud year for me. Um, but then the senior year, um, you know, we had a great season. We had a, we had a stifling defense. Um, and you know, we, we lost that, that playoff game to Garner, which was a, um, which was a, you know, that, that was, uh, that was a tough pill to swallow right there. Um, I'll tell you what, and that, that wasn't one of those things for me anyway. And I, I, I suppose I can speak for some other fellows on the team, probably everybody that that sting did not go away for, for years. Um, and, and so that was, it was unfortunate, but, you know, we happened to play a team that was, you know, I, and it may have taken me 30 years to admit this, but they were an extremely good team, very talented. They, we, we were, two evenly matched teams that just happened to grow up 10 miles apart. And, um, you know, that, that game could have went to us just as easily as to them. They won it and they, they did what they were supposed to do and they won that state championship. But yeah, that was a tough pill to swallow. That, that was real tough. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, you play that game 10 times. It's probably a five, five split. I mean, they're, uh, yep. I don't think Garner got touched the rest of the playoffs. And um, yeah. one thing, I can't remember who I was even talking to, but they're like, you know, we're just three years into consolidation at this point. That's what bumped us up to 2A. If we're still in 1A, you're probably looking at Brit, West, Brit state champs in 1A and Garner state champs in 2A that year. Obviously, we were some good Kanawha players that helped us out sure, on the no, team. So you yeah. need to not think about having those guys on the team, but hypothetically, yeah there could have been two state champions and, you know, within a 10 mile radius, there was a lot of good football in that area. So always has well, been, always well, will be, I think. You know, you're right. And, and, and I'll tell you what, uh, you know, the thing that was really impressive to me about uh, the, that time frame, I'd say our senior year, if you looked around the North Iowa conference, you know, there was all kinds of winning going on um, mm -hmm. in the state, uh, you know, Osage, I think, Maybe the boys won the basketball. The girls might have won the, the basketball. Osage, you know, Belmont had an awesome track team. Um, too. You know, Britt runner-up or Britt West Hancock runner-up in, in wrestling, track state champs. I mean, it was 
Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, what was going on, uh, but but there were some tremendous teams. And so you got a team like Osage who um, – you take Britt and Garner out of the mix, those stage probably could have won the state championship. I mean, it was, it was a really talented conference and uh, it, it, it was, it was, it was something. Yeah. Yeah. They, this, this year, 90 and 91 seasons are kind of regarded as the, probably the best teams that didn't make it to the dome. I mean, we've had obviously 31 playoff teams and yeah. these two teams are highly regarded, especially defensively and just, I put on my notes, smash mouth of defense. You had a lot of nasty, mean dudes playing defense on that team that, I mean, you're not going to give up more than a touchdown a game hardly, and that's pretty much how those seasons went. So, um, Yeah, you, yeah. just, Danny, real quick, you look at look at our defense. I mean, it, you know, not only a bunch of tough guys, but you had some really cerebral folks out there that were, were smart. I don't count myself in that group, but, you know, you got the linebackers with, with Rick Sanger and Ben Swears, mm-hmm. and those two were both animals. Um, uh, uh, Kevin Iceman, um, you know, John DeLeon back there, um, Nate Smith, uh, who was a freshman, um, and then that, that whole defensive line. Offense, too. I mean, it was, uh, it was just really talented, uh, a talented group of folks on that team. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing you wanted me to bring up, which made me really happy, because it's one thing I remember to this day, um, you wanted to bring up talking about picking captains for uh, for the football team. Um, what we do at Brit, I don't, and I don't know if they still do this, but when I was in school, and obviously when you're in school, was uh, everyone lays down on their stomach, closes their eyes, or they're supposed to, and Coach Sanger will read off a list of all the seniors. And every time you hear a senior's name, if you want them to be a captain, you lift your leg up in the air and he counts that as a vote. And then it was traditionally four captains usually. Um, I was selected as a captain my senior year. Like I said, that just, that's a memory that stands out to me. You were selected. Um, what'd that mean to you? And then also use this as a time to talk about um, Coach Perkins, Coach Sanger, any of the other coaches that you wanna, you wanna talk about here? Yeah, that was, you know, when I was thinking about this podcast and maybe just, you know, giving you a little bit of of my memories on certain things here and there. And there were a lot, of course. Uh, I, this is one that that came to mind and it's one I've talked to people about before, like Eric Cooley or some of that. We talked about this, you know, and we did the same thing. They brought us to the the football field, the the game field and 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 did the process and selected the captains. And, and I was selected and I was, I mean, I was honored. I was kind of shocked. Um, but the one thing that 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 was um, I remember thinking back then is that I never knew they did that. And I'm thinking, how did I get to my senior year laying on the end zone on the game field and we're lifting our leg for and I'm like, what are we doing? Uh, it, it, all those, you know, playing with all those. I, I never even knew that. I never even heard of that. And I thought it was the coolest thing. Um, of course, it's it's really nice when your peers think you're you're worthy of that. Um, that's great, but just the the process and uh, a process that's fair, you know, and and you get to get picked by your teammates, and that was that was a fun memory, and it was it was uh, it was great being a captain with uh, yeah. Rick Tanger and Kevin Iceman. Um, it, that, that was that was a good time. Yeah, I have the record book in front of me here, and like I said, it was one of the best honors I had growing up was to be a team captain. Um, I have a list here in the record book. I don't have them all because it was impossible to find them all, but just looking through the list here, uh, Skip Miller, Don Finch, Greg Byers, Steve Kelly, Chad Trollson, Stacey Gopal, Chad Klein. I'm just kind of nitpicking my way through this. Uh, Mitch Horseman, Nick Schmidt, Jake Moore, I'm, you know, kids younger and older than me. There's just, it's a who's who of Wes Hancock football. Um, people who got to be captains. I was obviously no and nowhere near the level of most of those guys, but for my peers, like you said, to, to select is a pretty big deal. So, yeah. And just, yeah, to and I, yeah, and I, I, told, I, I totally agree. And, and, and some of those names on there, you're right. It's a who's who I excluding myself um, of just really good, good players. Um, and, and I, the other interesting part about the captain selection, you know, w- at least with our team, you had myself, you had Rick Sanger and Kevin Iceman and, three different, three different ways to go about doing 
things, mm -hmm. which I thought, well, thought was interesting. You know, some people are more verbal leaders, some are not this or that or otherwise. And it, for us three, I thought it was a really good mix. And it, it was, uh, it, you know, just one more part of a, a really good team. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to take a little break here. I'm going to um, recognize our last two sponsors of the night. Um, Renee Deemer with uh, Deemer Realty. They have hometown hospitality and service with a smile. That's what Deemer Realty is all about. Helping buyers and sellers make a smooth transition when moving within or to the area is their top priority. Serving North Central Iowa since 1999, Deemer Realty has steadily grown over the years, establishing an outstanding record of sales in the North Iowa area that speaks to their dedication to every customer. That's Deemer Realty. You can go to DeemerRealty.net to check them out. And not to be outdone is Renee's husband, Jim Deemer, and the Brit Vet Clinic. The Brit Vet Clinic is also long-term sponsoring this podcast, along with Renee's business for 10 episodes. Uh, the vet, Brit Vet Clinic is located in downtown Brit. They're there for all your small animal vet needs and swine vet services. Call them at 843-3416 or email the Brit Vet Clinic at BritVetClinic at gmail.com. And one thing, Chad, I think you just, I just, this popped into my head, you'd get a kick out of. 843 is the first three numbers of a Brit phone number. Yep. My wife and I, for years now, whenever we check our phone or we go somewhere, and there's a clock somewhere, it is 843 almost every time we check. And at first my wife thought I was nuts. And I'm like, it's 843. And she goes, what? That's just a random time. I'm like, no, it's literally a number I dialed thousands of times, probably calling my friends or calling down to Mark's Pizza to order a pizza or something. But I always see 843 everywhere. And so now when I do this podcast, that, that always sticks out to me. That just random oh, thought that, in my head. I that's awesome. Know. I love it. I love it. Yep. So let's move on to wrestling here before I get yeah. more weird random thoughts in my head. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to run through your freshman, sophomore, and junior seasons here real quick, and we'll kind of bunch those together. And then I want to spend a good chunk of time on your senior year when you guys were state runner-ups. Uh, your freshman year as a team, you guys were five and seven in duels, which isn't terribly impressive for Brit wrestling. Uh, but mm -hmm. in the paper, Coach DeLeon was quoted for saying that he was really pleased because you guys were a really young team that year. You were 7-14 and 14 individually. Uh, you got fourth at sectionals. Your sophomore year, which would be 1990, you were 22-8, and eight, so that's quite the turnaround from 7-14. and 14. Uh, I read in the paper on my archives, you had the most falls on the team with 15. And that's not like you fell down, like you pinned somebody <laughs> in case you're not a wrestling person. Uh, most major decisions was six. You were third at sectionals. And if you don't know wrestling, if you're watching this, top two in sectionals move on to districts and then top two in districts move on to state. Um, what I found at sectionals was that you pinned your first opponent, lost seven to two, and then won four to one, assuming there wasn't a wrestle back there um, to, to move on. Uh, junior season, 1991. Like you said earlier, you missed the majority of that season due to that football injury in the Rockford yep. game. But um, what I read and what you told me is that you came back in time for sectionals. Um, you play second at sectionals to move on to districts. And then you were third at districts. So you were just shy of state uh, your junior year. So kind of recap or tell any stories or whatever you want to do from those, those first three years before we get into your senior year. Yeah, thanks for the recap. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, you know, some of those records you talked about, my, my freshman record or sophomore, or whatever, I didn't even know what it was. And so that was really interesting, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioning those. But, um, yeah, we, it, it was probably um, a historical freshman season for all of us because on varsity, you know, again, coming from Britt, West Hancock, um, I don't know if you typically have several freshmen on varsity, but you, you know, you had, you had myself, my twin brother, uh, Rick Sanger, John DeLeon, like John Matson, and I might be missing a couple, but there were five or six of us who were freshmen on varsity, and mm -hmm. you know, we got pounded uh, by, by these teams, um, and. So the record doesn't reflect, but, uh, the, you know, I, I'd say the one thing I remember is that all of us were, were pretty scrappy. And so, and I don't know 
anybody uh, in my class who were freshmen on that that varsity team. Um, I don't know anybody who didn't like stepping on that mat wrestling a, a state ranked senior, the tougher, the better. And I don't think anybody ever walked on that mat thinking they were going to get beat. I think they all thought at minimum um, they, they, they had a fighter's chance, a puncher's chance to pin some some state guy or this or that. So it was kind of a, yeah, we got beat a lot, but it was kind of fun because the expectations were kind of low and we always liked, um, you know, you know, um, exceeding expectations, but it was, a, it was a tough year of a lot of beatings. Uh, mm -hmm. Sophomore year, a lot of us, a lot of us did a lot of wrestling um, in the summer. Uh, John Madsen, myself, my brother, Rick, uh, John DeLeon, uh, you know, coach DeLeon, um, he would, he would roll up one of the wrestling mats and he'd take it to your house and throw it in the yard. So you could wrestle in the yard at your friend's place. And, um, and he, he would take us to tournaments, uh, in the summer. And, uh, we, we really improved, um, you know, as a team, but, but in particular, those, those of us who were freshmen that year before on varsity and, and, and yeah, with me, the junior year was almost shot. Um, uh, but I was able to come back, um, without this was my other knee that that was hurt during tryouts with uh Corey Mattoon uh he was um uh, I was wrestling him he was a sophomore and I don't I did something and my knee just popped and um ironically coach Sanger was actually at practice that day and that was just I, I couldn't even believe it um just coming off of surgery getting back on the football field losing and then a couple weeks later blowing another knee out and that was i'm telling you that was talk about another bitter pill to swallow that was that was really that was tough um and you know and the, the thing that i hated about that injury stuff is that you know you're looking at someone like coach sanger and coach de Leon, and you almost feel like gosh i hope they don't think i'm faking this um you know, my knee looked like it had a softball in it. So I, I, I knew they knew that wasn't the case, but nonetheless, um, I was able to, to get back without surgery to go to sectionals and districts. And I, you know, that there, there was a guy at districts who won it, who's just one of the best wrestlers I'd ever seen in my life. So I wasn't going to beat him, but then I, I, I wrestled, um, back and I think I lost a two to one decision, I believe. Um, and, something like that it was close uh but missed out and then then actually a few weeks later i had to have surgery on that knee and then i was able to come back and run a little track um but but yeah so the so freshman through junior um was kind of interesting a lot of us uh you know were real young and real inexperienced but by the time we became seniors um we you know we were the ones to beat and uh so yeah yeah and we'd had a pretty successful senior season. Yeah, when you were talking about a bunch of freshmen being on there, and that wasn't a real common thing, it reminded me of a story uh, that someone told me once about Billy Dolman. I'm sure he was in the wrestling room when you were there. Um, Absolutely. He was like, a, in, I don't remember where he went, but he was like an All-American in college or won some national championships and like some tournaments and stuff. And they were saying they don't think he ever actually like wrestled varsity in high school. People are like, how can a guy who places at national tournaments not have he said I didn't hardly could crack the two or three deep in high school? That was that was Brit wrestling back in the 60s, 70s, and most of the 80s, where yeah. there'd be 40, 50 guys out for wrestling, and you know, guys who didn't even uh, wrestle on the varsity were winning championships outside of high school after the fact. That's just how deep those teams were. So that give a little context to what you were talking about there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Co Coach Dahlman, uh, made, and by the way, a major, major influence. Um, uh, I mean, hundreds of wrestlers over 40 some years, at least. Um, uh, what a guy. I mean, he he broke my front tooth. So I have two fake teeth. One of them is because of Coach. You know, he didn't purposely do it. We were wrestling in practice and his head hit my tooth and his head was stronger. Um, and uh, no, no, I, yeah, I knew, I knew, I knew about uh, Coach Dahlman, and I, I, you know, he was behind someone in high school. I'm not quite sure who it was. Uh, you know, maybe one of the Hagans or or someone yeah. who had multiple state championships. But yeah, well, he was a talented wrestler and strong. 
um, strong. And, uh, and he was, he was our coach, you know, before we got to the freshman team and, you know, the eighth, seventh, eighth grade stuff. And he was, he was great. Um, um, yeah, real tough nose, real tough nose. And we learned a lot from all of them. And again, like time we got, got to our senior year and we were kind of the big man on the block then. Yep. Let's get to that senior year. You guys were state runner ups as a team. Um, it was essentially four of you guys that were a part of that team at state. Um, three of your teammates were runner-ups individually, and you ended up placing fourth um, to kind of give people some background on how wrestling works. Um, if you win four matches, you're a state champion, but if you lose twice, you're out. So if you lose your first round match, you get moved over to the consolation bracket, and then you have to win again and again and again. Um, what cracked me up in our talks earlier you said Eric Cooley called it the King's route that you had to take to get top four in the state. Um, so let's just kind of recap your matches here. I have them on here on our notes. Yeah. Uh, your first match at state, you lost six to five to a guy named Brian Jimenez of Liberty Center, Southeast Warren, which is actually where my first teaching job was there. I had Brian's son in my class and Brian was a youth football coach and I was the head football coach for a couple of years there. I could do a podcast on that experience, but um, I met Brian and knew him a little bit, so that kind of cracked me up when I saw his name there. Um, you wanted to tell your story about almost missing your first match. You lost six to five, but apparently that match yeah. didn't happen. Yeah, that yeah that that match was uh, yeah almost did not happen. I had never been to state wrestling um, in any capacity, and it, it, that that tournament. Now that was at the the uh, vets auditorium the barn yeah. um not the new new uh wells fargo uh place they have now but um you, you know i was just down in the kind of the, the, the cattle pens or whatever they call them and there's i mean there's people everywhere it's loud someone's constantly talking on a speaker and i don't know what i was doing i probably had some earphones in or something but i yeah i didn't i missed it or i didn't hear it and the next thing i know um you know, you know, the announcer is, is saying, you know, whatever, Chad Trollson, you're doing Matt one right now, uh, last, like last call. And so I took off out of there and I ran into coach Potts and he got me there. And so, um, and that's, that's not my style of getting prepared for a match, rushing and getting nerved up and, and doing all that. I need a lot of time to think and, you know, get a plan ready. And so I stepped on that mat. It was, it was chaos. And uh, like you said, I wrestled Brian, lost six to five. And, you know, I, I, nothing was, um, it was just a strange match for me. It was a strange feeling. I wasn't uh, the, the way I, I should have been. And, you know, my legs felt like they weighed a million pounds. And um, yeah, it, it, yeah. So it was uncharacteristic. So I was, I was pretty upset after that first match. Cause I don't, you know, uh, I shouldn't have lost that match. Um, um, and, uh, and I did. And so then, then it was one of those things where, um, as a matter of fact, in 1992 was the first year they allowed you to, uh, lose two matches before that you lose one, you're done. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, or that first, at least that initial round. And, um, so, uh, I, you know, I took advantage of that opportunity to kind of wrestle through the back of the bracket, um, and then had, uh, short, shortly after that loss, maybe a couple hours later, I, I wrestled uh, again, and um, I think you had on your note, I, I think I won that nine to six. Yep, over Ben uh, Kolovnov of Clarksville, Allison Bristow. Yep, yep, that was, um, yeah, you know, so my only goal in that match was to just win, um, which typically, you know, that, that was always my wrestling. I was, if you ever watched me wrestle, I was perhaps the most boring wrestler you ever saw. Um, cause I didn't, you know, I didn't care about anything other than just winning. So if I won by one point, it didn't matter to me. And I, I didn't, I, we'd go overtime. doesn't matter. I, I just proceeded every match that we're going to go six, eight, nine minutes overtime. doesn't matter. And so, um, you know, nine to six, it seems close, but that, the match wasn't close. I think I, uh, got that fella in a in a cradle and i think i just had him in a cradle for three or four minutes you know <laughs> i just wanted to win i was just waiting for time to run out and that's 
you know, not characteristic of me either in a pinning combination. I, I, I should have probably pinned him. We could have got more points, but yeah. I was just thinking about survival at that point. And yeah. so, so yeah, we got through that match and then it was, the day was over and then it was on to the, the next day. Um, and kind of a funny, I don't know if it's a funny story. It's an interesting story. And I, uh, again, as thinking about our podcast, I was just trying to think of certain things, but I didn't really tell you about this, but, you know, after the day was over, um, we would go back to the motel and I don't know if any of the wrestlers have ever talked about, uh, the motel, uh, but coach De Leon picked out this small roadside looking motel that he had used for years, you know, probably in the sixties. And yeah. he, he wasn't into taking us to some fancy hotel in downtown Des Moines or you no, know, he isolated us and, you know, we're at this hotel and I think it was, I asked Rick Sanger not too long ago, what that, what the, what the name of the hotel was and did it still exist. And I think it was called the Baker Motel, I think. Mm -hmm. And Rick sent me a picture a couple of years ago. It had been demolished, you know, five, six, eight years ago, but he had a couple of pictures of it. But nonetheless, after the, the day's wrestling activities are done, we go back to the hotel and you know, relax or whatever. And I, re I remember after that first day, we, we went to a uh, coach's room and, and, you know, we were all in there. Mrs. DeLeon was in there. And, um, you know, when John DeLeon did his podcast, he talked about coach and Mrs. DeLeon and how, how much they were a team. And, and so she was very involved with, with wrestling. And I, I remember her sitting in the chair and she kind of had the, the, you know, the, 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 the paper and the wrestling schedules and kind of trying to keep us straightened out about what's going on. Um, because for me, especially, uh, I needed that cause I'd never been there. I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And she, I remember her, I don't remember the exact words, but I remember her saying about this next fellow I wrestled, uh, Kurt Fry, Yep. And I won, I think I won, you had the step. I think I won three to two. Five to two. Yep. Five to two, five to two. From East Union Afton. Yep. Yeah. Well, before I wrestled him and this, we were in the hotel that night, you know, she kind of looked at it and it's like, wow, you know, you got this, you got this kid from, from here and something of the sort of, you know, he's, he's, he's pretty good. You know, he, he's pretty good. And I remember, I remember thinking he's pretty good, good, um, good. And so, you know, we went back to the hotel and I, I don't know if I slept all night. I had music playing and cause that next day there was no way that that kid was going to beat me in that match. And it, my whole mindset with him, and it, it could have been anyone in the world. It just so happens it was him, but my mindset with in that match was that I'm going to break, uh, that kid's, um, motivation. Um, it, he's going to lose. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, you mentioned the score was five to two. The score might as well have been a hundred to two because it wasn't even close. It, and mm -hmm. I, I looking back on that, I think that was probably the best match I wrestled all year. And he was a tough opponent no less, but, uh, yeah, Mrs. De Leon got me motivated and I, yeah, I was like, okay, I can't wait, you know, cause like I said earlier, again, us freshmen who used to get beat pretty good. Um, we, we like that. I like the better they are, the better for me. Let's, you know, let's go. And so that was a memorable match for me. And that, and I thank Mrs. De Leon for providing the motivation. So that was fun. She, she probably knew what she was doing the whole time. Oh, she, she, oh absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So you, uh, one thing you put in the notes that we we're putting together is you kept asking coach Potts how many more matches you had and he just kept telling you one more match. Um, so your fourth yeah. match, uh, to get into the third and fourth place match, as opposed to the fifth and sixth place match, you had to go against Cody Eldred Elridge from West Marshall and you beat him 12 to four. I put in my notes, that was your first dominating win of the tournament, but then you just yeah. said that that fry kid, it might as well have been a hundred to two. So it felt like you're kind of getting into your stride there. Um, yeah. So that, that puts you in the, the third and fourth place match. 
and you got to wrestle five matches at state. Um, you had to face Mike Silver from Central City, and uh, he beat you 12 to 2 and got you fourth place at state. What do you remember about those last couple matches? Well, you know, after so after I won my second match, that's when I went to Coach Pazza, uh, who was my wrestling partner for two years. I mean, if not for him, I never would have been there. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, of course, all the other coaches, Coach Daly on everything, but he actually came in and wrestled with me um, uh, because me wrestling Rick Sanger didn't do me any good because Rick just beat me up. So uh, we needed someone who was good but wouldn't beat me like Rick would. Hard. But you beat him um, in so, the 5K at Hobo Days, so that, you got I, that I, place, so. I passed him. I mean, it might have only been two, three seconds, but I did pass him. Uh, so, wins, <laughs> wins. Um, but yeah, I, I would ask, you know, because I didn't, I didn't really know, and so after losing that first match, my goal was I need to, I want to place at least, otherwise it's not going to be a successful season for me in my in my mind. Mm -hmm. so I asked Dan you know how, how many more of these matches I got to do to at least place and I wasn't looking to settle for just six play or whatever I just wanted to know and he just kept saying with the straightest face you ever saw too just just one more win this next one you're good to go yep. I win it I'm like where are we at well you you just just win this next one and then you're gonna you're good to go i didn't know any different i didn't have time to go figure it out either so yeah. i just listened and uh Better not so yeah yeah it went it, yeah it went good and uh and i think actually at dan at state i think i wrestled six mm -hmm. matches so that there was a match in there somewhere that i didn't see but um that was for the eldridge match and it was the night before and i beat that uh wrestler two to one. It was a really close match. He was a really good wrestler. Um, I don't remember his name or anything and I have a tape of it somewhere, but it's only about a minute long because the recorder wasn't working. So, so six matches and yeah, Eldridge, I, I beat him. Um, pretty good. That was a good match for me. He was a good wrestler. I just hit my stride. And then, like you said, you know, Mike Silver, Central City. So yeah, you know, and he was a really good wrestler. I think the year before he, he was third, I think. So he'd been there before he was, he was uh, really good. Uh, but uh, I, I was kind of disappointed in a 12 to two score. I had been beat like that my whole senior year. The, the few losses I had were only by a few points. Um, mm -hmm. It just so happens that Mike Silver liked to do an arm bar tilt. And so, which is, was kryptonite to me. Um, it's like the one, the one thing that I'm not good at defending and he just happened to do it. Um, so that, that, that was, that was a, a tough match with regards to the score. Um, but, but, you know, fourth place and we got some team points and that's what, what kind of mattered at that point to me was we'll see if I can get some points at least to yeah. you know, help, help the other guys out on the team. Yeah, so I, I did some digging in the uh, Iowa High School Athletic Association uh, record books. Uh, you got your team 10 team points, um, which was important. It didn't matter in the state champ versus state runner up because Lisbon ran away with 137 points, and we got second with 73. So they about doubled our point total. But um, Anita was third place with 60, 13 points back of us, and Clarksville Allison Bristow was fourth with 50 points. If you would have folded after that first loss, if you would have bowed out of the tournament, been 0 for 2, um, second place wasn't going to happen because yeah. of there were some other kids in, those, in your bracket from those teams that would have gained those points and jumped ahead. So we're probably looking at third, fourth, or fifth place and not state runner-ups, um, especially since you wrestled and beat that kid from Clarksville, Allison Bristow. Um, so there, there was a lot of woulda, coulda, shouldas in there. If you wouldn't have you know, you would have said, screw it, I'm done after, the, you know, I lost the first round, yeah. I'm not going to be state champ, what's the difference? We're looking at a different trophy in the trophy case, if if not, maybe at all. So yeah. it's uh, commendable to, to, to keep on going instead yeah. of just giving it up. Yeah, you know, that's, I, and I didn't know that. Um, yeah. I, I, I did not know that, and I'm glad you told me that, because um, that's a great picture, too. Matter of fact, 
Someone just sent me that picture about six months ago. I'd never seen that. Really? Yeah, I'd never seen it. I love it. Um, but yeah, you know, so yeah, I really wanted to get some team point. I didn't, again, at the time, understand what I was contributing, if it helped or not, but I knew, mm. you know, it probably didn't hurt. And so uh, let's keep going. But, you know, you, you get that type of motivation from, from, from guys like this you're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. because after my first round match, you know, the first thing that, that I do is run into, you know, saying or asking what happened, how'd you do, or uh, John DeLeon or Kerry Meyer, um, um, you know, and how uh, you lost, we'll come back, you know, you, you know, just encouragement and, and getting you to a, a mental state where you want to, want to keep, keep going and not get too disappointed in yourself. Cause we all have the, the goal of winning a state championship. Um, I mean, that's, that, that's what we go into the, the tournament for. And that's what coach, you know, everything that coach De Leon did all those years, you know, uh, these relaxation drills, he would do the, um, I don't know if anybody's ever talked about the fact that coach De Leon would never send in any paperwork on us to get us ranked in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which was just savvy and smart, you know, you, you know, when I showed up at state, there wasn't anyone there that know, knew who I was. Yep. And and he did that on purpose, just like he put us in the old Baker Motel and sequestered us from, from all these these antics that occur at state wrestling. So um told his wife to badger you and the getting ready for the next match. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean it's it's all it was all genius to me. Um and you know, learned a lot about a lot of things uh by all my coaches and in particular coach De Leon um and 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 the, the the dominant program that he built um and you know sustained also with with the awesome coaches that we had uh Bill Dom Dan Potts uh, I mean so uh Ron Finch you know you know all these all these people it was it was it was pretty important so we felt good about bringing home that second place trophy at least put a little little hardware uh back at the school yep definitely people still walk by that trophy every day pretty neat yep. to be a part of that so that kind of segues us into this next last part, and one of the last parts here of this, um, what you're called the, the Brit way or the West Hancock way. You wanted to talk about your hometown pride a little bit, the work ethic that that the coaches and the people in Brit gave you, and um, you know some of the things you post on Facebook, or you know you always mention Brit, and you're always proud of where you're from. And um, what else do you want to add to to what you maybe already haven't said, or piggyback on what you have said? But, yeah, I mean. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you introduced that well, you know, it is the Brit way. And <clears throat> yeah, you know, for, for, for me and a, and a lot of a lot of us, uh, it, we, we got a lot of this through sports and um, and all of that. But, you know, there's that larger mentality that permeates through Brit. And, um, it, and I don't know if you can put your finger on it. I don't think people run around you know, town saying this is the Brit way and here's a instruction manual on how to do it. You know, people live it, you know, and they don't talk about it. Like, every, you know, that's one thing I liked about Brit. People don't do a lot of talking either in terms of, you know, bragging. That uh, bragging and being arrogant and all that stuff is frowned upon, I think. I, I don't know if it still is. I'm sure it is. But, you know, that there was, you know, we all played teams that didn't practice that philosophy. Mm -hmm. And, whether it be wrestling track, football, I mean, it could be band, it could be choir, and whatever it is, uh, that, that, that mentality, you, you know, that just kind of sh shut your mouth and put in the work and your work will talk, talk for you. You don't have to run your mouth, walk the walk, don't talk the talk type of thing that we've heard a million times. And it just, that's just the way it was. And, um, and I like that. So, yeah. you know, I, coming from such a successful program in town and, you know, and I'm talking about farmers too. I'm talking about everybody. Uh, they just work hard uh, up there in, in multiple ways, but, you know, coming from what we came from, I've, you know, I've always thought that and this is true for me. I don't know if it's true for everybody else, but, you know, I think people search uh, when you're part of something like that, I think people search their whole life to, to be a part of something that 
uh, if you want to call it special or that close knit with your friends, being successful, working hard, doing the right thing, uh, things like that. And so this whole notion of the Brit way, in my mind, bleeds through your whole life. And so, and, I, and I'll tell one quick story because uh, I don't, I don't want to keep you all night, but, um, you, you know, I wasn't ever particularly the best academic student in high school. I wasn't the worst, you know, I worked hard. I could have worked harder probably. Um, but I went to college, you know, at NIAC and I did pretty, pretty good, which was a, a big confidence boost for me. I went to Northern Iowa, did well. And then I went to uh, Sam Houston State University for a master's and a PhD, but initially a master's degree. And I was kind of scared, like, you know, can I handle this? Am I, mm -hmm. am I smart enough? Um, you know, so there are certain doubts about that. But the one thing that was always in my mind and solidified the first class I took in graduate school, I walked in and there are, you know, probably 15 of us in there, small graduate school courses and yeah, I'm looking around and we've got some lawyers in there already. I have a law degree and someone's working on a second master's and this and that and successful people. And mm -hmm. so that didn't help my self-esteem, but I just kind of looked around uh, the room. Um, and, and just in my mind, I, I, I thought, you know, there's no one in this room that will outwork me, period. Um, it's just, just not going to happen. So that was my saving grace. And that's, that's the Brit way, you know, looking across the room saying, yeah, you may be better. You may be this, you may be that, but you're not, you're not going to outwork me. And that served me well, um, over the years. And that's, that's a direct result of, of Brit and those teachers and coaches and community and all of that. Yeah. Another example of the Brit way is last year when I was doing the record books, and I wanted to just give those puppies away, but then I realized how expensive that would be. And yeah. you were one of the first people who you gave 500 bucks and you threw that out there online and said, all right, people, let's get to it. Let's get these things paid for. And, and yeah. then another guy said, hey, anything extra, let's just give to the legacy fund. And then almost $11,000 later, given to the fund, I, that's, that's the Brit way. People are just always giving. And, and then you also talked about uh, your your piece of property you still have outside of Brit Trollson Oil. Um, you said yeah. a couple of your buddies still go check on that once in a while for you. Uh, real quick here before we wrap this up, tell us about that that property you have out there that you're pretty proud of. Well, it's you know it, it's it's a it's a family piece of land. It's very small, but it's been in our family for more than a hundred years. And I had an opportunity to acquire it and. You know, and I thought it would it, it, it would be a shame if I didn't, uh, because my, you know, my parents uh, have passed away. And so the, you know, the home we grew up in is, you know, sold and gone and all of that. So um, I thought this was one way where I could kind of keep some of my, my roots in Iowa. Um, uh, and like we talked about before the program, out at that property is, is where most of my athletic achievements, my football jerseys. This is a reproduction I have on, but they're buried out there. So they stay in Brit forever. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I decided to, to, to keep it, to uh, improve it. It was an old gas station in the fifties and sixties and seventies that uh, numerous people went to back in the day and still remember it. And so we're fixing it up. Uh, we'll put a little cabin out there. We're going to, we're going to bring the old gas pumps uh, back. Um, they're getting restored. And, uh, you know, it's um, it's just a place where I can go or my family can go when we're in town. Or if, if someone needs a place to stay and they got nowhere to go, uh, we can get them a key. Um, you know, things like that. And so, mm -hmm. just, again, just another way to maybe keep a little, keep a little more contact with Brit. And uh, uh, because it just, to me, I don't know, in my mind, it would just be a shame for 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 me not to have more more connection back back home and so i thought that was one way to keep that up yep definitely well, we're going to wrap this up but one more example of the brit way um, are the sanger cornhole boards uh kurt kapachik wes hancock grad uh he lives down in georgia and i've mentioned this on several podcasts and put it online uh, Britt Way, he's like, hey, Dan, we need another way to raise money for the Legacy Fund. 
I got this company that can make these amazing cornhole boards. They're like 275 bucks. Um, he got them made with Coach Sanger's accomplishments and pictures on them. Uh, he donated it, paid for it himself, and then we're selling raffle tickets. Um, we haven't sold many tickets just lately, so I'm trying to keep plugging them. Five bucks each, no limits on how many you can buy. You can Venmo me, send me a check, PayPal, um, whatever you want to do. I'll have that information on the, uh, on the link tonight. We're going to do that drawing on the 25th with the 96th state championship football team. Um, I'll be up at Hobo Days with it. He actually just shipped those up to his parents. That costs another 85 bucks. And he's like, nope, I'm donating the money for shipping just so you can get them up there and sell more tickets. So um, thanks to Kurt and uh, Living the Brit Way. Uh, if you uh, don't want the boards, but you still want to give to the Legacy Fund, obviously you can go to sangerstrong.com. Uh, thanks again to Ewing Funeral Home. Jay Hiscox, Estate Farm Insurance, Deemer Realty, Brit Vet Clinic, and The Party Taxi for sponsoring tonight's episode with Chad. Um, give Chad another minute here after I go through the next uh, the lineup for the next couple months to give his last shout outs and stuff. But coming up, I got another Trollson. Next Saturday, I'm actually going to the home of Jim Trollson. He's a 98-year-old um, lifelong Brit resident. He scored the only touchdown of the 1942 football season for Brit. Um, I hooked up with his grandson, Dan Trollson. Um, we're going to chat next Saturday at his house uh, that Saturday morning before the parade. After that, I have Chuck Boozman, Russ King, Aaron Rasmussen. Actually, I have the 96 football team before Aaron Rasmussen. Rod Barkema, former Kanawa coach. Ann Hagen, Brent Hagen, Jason Harley, Dwayne Cook, Rachel Lear, Dave Smith, Gene Gunther. And then I have just added six more episodes that I'm going to shoot next March, April, and May, it looks like, on my calendar. I have the Eisman boys, Mark, Craig, and Bob. I have Candace Wilson, Jeff Nielsen, Bob Horner, the former Brit coach who was the Mason City basketball coach for a couple championship seasons, uh, John Wyland, and then you've mentioned him, Paul Haugi. Coach Haugi is going to be one of my guests on here. So I'm pretty excited. Um, I have these things booked out for the next six, seven, eight months, whatever it ends up being. So I'm excited to keep putting money into the legacy fund and getting people telling their stories like Chad here. So Chad, like always, do you have any last um, stories, last words, last shout outs, anything you want to throw out there before we end, end this up? Uh, this up? No, I just say, I just say thanks to you. And uh, yeah, I mean, you got an impressive list of people you're going to talk to. And I, I really enjoy watching these and I know everybody else does too. And uh, I guess the question is who's going to do your interview? Are we gonna get get some get you on the interview hot seat yeah, or I'm not that exciting. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I told the Eisman boys I, I went you know went to school with a lot of the Eisman uh younger guys and then went to college with uh, Bob's son Doug and I told them I guys I'm running out of ideas, so I'm resorting to Eisman's, but I think that would be <laughs> bottom of the barrel if I did my own episode. I don't know if that'd be good. So we'll see. <laughs> Someday, well, like could, episode 96, and I'm like, I have nobody left. We'll maybe go with that, but, but yeah. Well, it's, uh, no, but thanks again to you. You've done a lot for a lot of things here. So uh, I'm just uh, uh, glad to be associated and know you, and uh, uh, thanks for talking to me, and uh, look forward to seeing you at Hobo Days. Yep, I'll be there next Friday. I'll get there in the morning and um, have some stuff to do, people to see, and then, yeah, be uptown selling the boards, alumni banquet, and having a good time so hobo golf on saturday yeah yep. good to see you all right everybody thanks for tuning in uh make sure you give to the legacy fund and um, buy some cornhole board tickets and see you at hobo days sign up for the alumni banquet my uh my goal with bill frito is to get some i can't say i'm young anymore but some younger people attending the banquet um in future years so all right go eagles go eagles <laughs>